I'm saving pages here because as he says, the Lord's the one that orchestrates and organizes and I'm saving these hymnal pages because it impresses me how the Lord, and I know Brother Larry's had it happen to him and there's other preachers and pastors in here. I know you've had it happen to you, but from the first hymn, you know, well, we're on the right track. Amen. And because uh, uh, there's, uh, you know, this, uh, there's a lot to preach in here. Amen. And a lot runs through a preacher's mind at times like this. What should I preach? And, you know, things of that nature. But I, I, I saved the page of the, hymn, the hymns we sang tonight. And uh, that last verse, verse of faith is the victory on page 37. It says, to him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Amen. And then we got on that other one on what a day that will be, the other hymn we sang. And it says, there'll be no sorrow there, no more Amen. burdens to bear. And uh, where was it at there? No more, uh, where is it? No more the eye, where is it at there? Uh, there's coming a day when the marsh come, and no more birds there, no more sickness, pain, no part of them. Forever open. Yeah, I know I saw it there, no, no more tear that dim the eye. There it is, it's in the first verse on the second. Stands at the uh, clouds in the sky, and no more tears to dim the eye. Amen. So point that out to you, and you'll catch it as we as we start through. And uh, that's how I knew. It's just yeah. exciting me. Brother Larry saw me. I, it's exciting when you know that you're right in the center where you need to be. Amen. So, but I'm thankful you're here tonight. It's been a it's been outstanding uh, to be here with you, and I've enjoyed it, that every bit of it. And I pray that the rest of the week continues on that way. I know the Lord is doing something here in the midst, and uh, I'm sure of that. Uh, Brother Tate's not doing nothing in the midst, but I, I'm just doing my best to deliver his message. Amen. Amen. And uh, so I'm thankful you're here tonight. And uh, Brother Larry got to see the accommodations up close and personal today, and uh, uh, it's, it's wonderful. Isn't oh, it's very it? nice. It's, it's wonderful. So thank you again for uh, taking good care of us while we're here. All right, well, let's get started tonight, and I'm not going to review too much. I have a bad habit of that of reviewing where we've been, but we do, uh, we, we have some with us tonight that hasn't been with us, and uh, we'll be in the Gospel of Luke tonight, but I started off this week in the book of Haggai, and as I was preaching in Haggai, the Lord on the second night made it clear to me that he's turning me and heading me another direction. And rather than continue and press on with a man's plan, I said, let's just follow the Lord. Amen. And so we were in the book of Acts last, last night, and tonight we are in the Gospel of Luke. So, as we get started here tonight, I, I want us to remember what we covered last night for just a touch, just, for the, just to get our minds set to come out of the world and get these things out of our mind. I hope the hymns helped you do that. But remember, we talked about that Philippian jailer, mm -hmm. and we, we pointed out some things for those that have a hard time seeing God's sovereignty. Uh, I don't know how you can read the Bible and not see it as he directed his path all the way over there. And as I told you, I'm not saying it's the hard line, but uh, as I added up through maps and the information I could find, roughly 935 miles that journey was. Mm -hmm. And then even as he was cast into prison, he was thrust in there, means intensely, and uh, he was put in there. As I said, I said it doesn't necessarily, we don't have it in the Bible, but I know for a fact that Paul knew he was right where he should be. Right. And at the end of it, I told you that what was the Paul and Silas really in prison. And I know that's what we, we, when we read the Bible, we get that, but I was trying to get you to take that view that it depends on which side of the bars you're looking from. Mm -hmm. Paul was in the center of God's will. The Philippian jailer was not. It's Paul it. had stops, uh, stops on his feet. He was fast held there with that. The Philippian jailer is outside. He's outside with no stops, but he is the one being held. Amen. And if you're here tonight and you have not Jesus Christ, you may be walking around in this community free, but you're in bondage. Amen. You're in bondage. Amen. You may look at the preachers and say, oh, look at the things and the lines they got to carry or the other brothers and sisters here. Oh, look at how they, they have to live a certain way and they have to do this and have to. No, they don't have to. They do because of what they've been set free from. Amen. So it's all about the view. 
Well, tonight here in the Gospel of Luke, I'm going to look at a question. Because questions stimulate thought. And I hope it'll help you with the direction we've been headed. In the beginning of Luke chapter 13, we're going to, we see some things that has taken place. We see judgment, we see the fig tree, we see the Sabbath, and we see the kingdom. But then there's a question on verse 23. And I'll review as I'm preaching, and we'll cover these things because they are important. But I tend to think sometimes that people of the world and maybe those that have not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ yet, they, they fill themselves with many questions. <laughs> many questions. Well, I don't know about this. I don't know about that. I've heard this. I've heard that. But we look here in verse 23 and we see a question that was posed to our Lord. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And it hits me in a way of this, and how would that help you? Yeah. Are there few that be saved? And I'm, you know, I'm not trying to be flippant, but I, as a preacher, I turn that back to you. And how will that help you? All right. Amen. The center focus of tonight is you. Right. Amen. You are in the crosshairs. Amen. You are the bullseye. We need not worry about what else is out there in the woods. We worry about you. Mm hmm we look back at the beginning of Luke 13, and let me start it off with this, because a lot of times when bad things happen, the first thing our, our, our finite minds think is, well, there must have been something going wrong over there. There must have been something bad going on. Look at the beginning of Luke chapter 13. It says, there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you nay. But, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Amen. Or of those eighteen, upon whom the tower in Siloam fell, and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Amen. And if you're in here tonight, and you know the Lord's been dealing with you, you know the Lord's been stirring you, and you keep pushing off and pushing off, it's the same answer. Mm -hmm. Amen. If you do not repent, ye shall perish. Right. You say, well, I thought this church, and I thought you, and all these brethren in here, I thought we believe in sovereign grace. I thought we we believe God is sovereign over all things that we do. Amen. And he is. Amen. But I want to take you, guys, that's, I guess it's just my thing this week, I want to take you somewhere else before I really get into where I want to be tonight in the text. I'm going to go to the book of Ecclesiastes, because I want to set the tone with you that this, tonight, all week, tomorrow night, is serious business. Mm -hmm. You, if you want to push it off and be flipping about it and think it doesn't matter, uh, you will not be able to say you were not told. Amen. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, just in case you ever read this, I, I want to make it clear to you. Because where I'm going with this is because tonight could be your final night. Mm -hmm. You say, oh, the preacher's trying to scare us. No, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to give you reality. Amen. Tonight could be my final night. Right. I can't tell you how many curves I've went around this week in Tennessee. <laughs> it could be my final night. Mm -hmm. I, don't tell you, I can't tell you how many deer I've had to stop and let them cross the road. It could be your night. Mm -hmm. It could be your hour. Verse 11 of Ecclesiastes 9 says, I return and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, 
nor yet favor to men of skill. But time and chance happeneth to them all. Mm -hmm. For man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught up in the snare. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time, when it faileth, falleth suddenly upon them. Amen. You say, but I just thought God's sovereign. He knows the beginning to the, the, to the end. He knows, he knows everything. He does. Mm -hmm. He's talking about men. That's right. Amen. It's time and chance to you, not him. And he sends a messenger to get you prepared for that. Just as I said in Luke 13, just as Jesus was explaining and teaching, here's the best thing you can do. Don't approach a building and say, well, before I walk in it, because I know what that happened in the Bible, I need to make sure everything's good, this foundation is good before I go in, because it could fall upon me. I want you to understand time and chance happeneth to them all. You want to be safe walking in the building? Repent. Amen. Amen. You want to be safe when you go out in the community? Repent. Amen. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what matters. You're right. You say, well, I, I think I have. If you think you have, you better check. Mm -hmm. I know I have. Amen. And I want to testify to you, even though I know I have, I have made mistakes after I had. I sinned after I had. But praise the Lord for his word in 1 John 1, 9. Yeah. That I can confess my sin. And he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Amen. Amen. You, you need to really read the Bible. A lot of the Bible was written to save folk. Mm -hmm. Amen. Time of chance happens to them all. The book of Job, we know that he is sovereign. He knows our steps, the numbers of them. Mm -hmm. I, my grandfather told a man that time, one time he'd come up there and he wouldn't go to church and he just wouldn't hear granddaddy. And he professed that he was saved and he says, well, I hope you are. He says, because your steps are numbered. Mm -hmm. So the next time he'd come over to visit granddaddy, guess what he did? He rode up on a horse. He said, preacher, I thought about what you said. So I'm not doing the steps, the horse is. And he said, I know you think that's funny, but you covered the same miles. Here we go. That's right. Your steps are numbered. We need to be very attentive. I've said all week, we are in strange times this Amen. year of 2023. It's only going to get a little more strange. You're right. What would be strange to me is to sit here all week and hear the gospel proclaimed and the word preached. And I, again, I don't want anyone here to think I'm being arrogant, not because I've done it, whether it be Brother Larry or any other preacher in this congregation tonight. If the word's proclaimed, it's proclaimed because it's truth. Amen. Amen. Now, there are some others out there preaching other gospels, but we focus on the truth. Amen. So what I want to get to tonight is this question. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And now we'll look at his response. And he said unto them, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Amen. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut, the shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Amen. We don't believe in a works salvation. We believe in a faith. Mm -hmm. Faith, a trust, a belief in Jesus Christ. But as my, as I've been preaching all week, I've been saying we need to focus, mm -hmm. and we really do need to focus. But it's a time to contend. It's a time to contend. So with that, let's focus. Think about this. He was worried about the curious things, the things that do not concern him. Now, you need to realize that these are Jewish people that this account's taking place with. 
These are the Jews. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is applicable. Because what's really going on here, what he is saying, what he is showing them is you need to strive. You need to, you need to put forth. You need to think about this. And what's he mean by that? He means push the philosophy aside. Mm -hmm. push, push, the, push the genealogy aside. Push these things aside. And that's what we ought to be doing here this week. That's why we gather. We have, we have, I don't know if the proper word would be strove, but we are striving to hear truth and to hear more of it and yeah. to have it clarified more and more and more to us. Mm -hmm. That is an effort. Don't get mistaken that well, but we're solving grace Baptist. We, you know, he's going to do what he's going to do. We're going to be saying, yes. Absolutely, God will have his will done. Mm -hmm. But we have to put an effort forth by getting up, dressing up, showing up, coming, and assembling. Amen. That's an effort. And he's telling these Jews, and this one that asked, you need to strive. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is here. Mm -hmm. Push these things aside. Push them aside. It's interesting, the word strive, it actually, you find it is more of like an athletic term. I know many of you know the Bible, but we're going to touch on some of these. The word try, strive, it means struggle. It means literally compete for a prize. It's figuratively to contend with an adversary or a genitive case, to endeavor to accomplish something. Hebrews 12.1. Run the race. Amen. Right. It's a form of striving. We're going to look at a few of these verses because I don't want you to think and I don't want you to misappropriate what I'm saying tonight. That will preach your sign and work for my salvation. No, no. But your job is to listen to the truth. Amen. Well, let's look, let's just go ahead. Let's hit Hebrews while we're thinking of this. Hebrews 12. See, it's just like what you see on TV. Uh, we are at a point now that our government does not want to hear the truth. Amen. So what they do is they throw out things and put things out there in front of you trying to distract you away from the truth. And that's their philosophy. Uh, the Bible called, talks about vain jangling. Amen. You know, it's almost like a song, jangle, jangle, jangle. <laughs> I mean, that's all people want to do is fill their mind up with things that does not matter. But the truth is before you. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we are also, or we also are compassed about so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. What's that mean? Mm -hmm. Strive. Be focused. Lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us, there it is, run the race. Run mm -hmm. with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. Mm -hmm. You think about it like this. There's athletic, there's, there's professional sprinters. And when they sprint, they give it everything they have. They're, they're pulling on every muscle they have. And I don't know what the recovery time for them is, it is but if you notice in the Olympics, they never, they never have them back to back. Right. There's recovery time. When you've exerted yourself that you've used all energy, it costs you something. Mm -hmm. It costs you something. Let's go back to the Gospels. Um, John 18. I got a lot of others I'll just give you, but I, I won't make you turn to each one. We will turn to one more after this. John 18, verse 36. Jesus speaking of his disciples here. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. 
But now is my kingdom not from hence. And that word fight is that strive. Same Amen. definition as I read you, to struggle, to literally, to compete for a prize. Amen. To fight against the adversary. And that's what Jesus is saying. Mm -hmm. He's all around us. Mm -hmm. If I counted up this week, I don't know how many churches, loosely, that you pass. Mm -hmm. And everyone's got a different view on how to get to heaven, You're how right. to live eternally with the Lord, how to do this, how to do that. But we depend on the Bible. We, we depend on the living word. Amen. My last example of this before we move forward, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I think this will set it right where it needs to be. The good fight. And what is it of? Of faith. Amen. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou Keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Fight the good fight. So if we'll jump back to my text now, back in Luke, we'll go ahead and get to carrying on with this tonight. That question, and what a question it is. I think it would be probably a very prominent question if we went out with clipboards. I, I know that there was some, uh, a, a van, I don't want to say a van, but a, a, a strike of Baptist. They used to do that. They'd take a clipboard and go house to house. And if you were looking for a church, what would you look for in it and things like that. And they were using that as an approach to just even get uh, get a conversation going. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm, if, you know, I'm not going there tonight, what I'm saying though, but if we took a clipboard and did that, and ask just we're not doing anything but asking you we want your opinion how can i know that i will live with the lord or in the term that's most commonly known how do i know how will i know that i will reign in heaven live in heaven hmm. and you would be amazed you'd run out of paper the answers you'd get right yeah when really god in one sentence on there This is the question. Are there few that be saved? The question, are you saved? That's it. Amen. How will I be saved? Amen. There's something important I want you to see as we're here in Luke 13. I love his answer back to him. And he said unto them, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter and shall not be able. And now it's going to be a turn of pages tonight for a little bit, and then it'll calm down. I want you to see that question again. I want you to lay your eyes on it, because now I want to take you to Matthew 22. We'll stay there in the Gospels, but Matthew 22, because this is a this is a part of what I was talking about with the hymns tonight. Matthew 22, and for the sake of time, I will not read everything. But it's talking about it's talking about the marriage that's been being prepared for the king's son, and we see here in verse eleven it says, "And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment, and he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment?" And what was his response? I've been baptized. I worked. Says he was speechless. That's it. Amen. I think we've got too flippant. The world's got too flippant about how they're going to respond because they will stand before him. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll just tell him this. I'll just tell him that. You'll stand there speechless. Amen. Amen. He is God. He is Christ. He is the Savior of the world. We've become too flippant with this. Why is that important? Well, 
because we're fixing to enter into some Jewish culture here is what I'm trying to bring you to. See, in the culture of the Jews, when the wedding takes place, it is the groom's responsibility to make sure that the people have their garments, that the men have their garments. Mm -hmm. Because, see, we in America wouldn't understand that because we've gotten into this just come as you are attitude. And look, and I, where I pastor, the church I pastor, I, I tell our people all the time, and it's not hard because they're not like that. They got, they're just a good, loving group of people. But if a visitor comes in and does not dress the way we think they should dress, our first greeting to them shouldn't be, how you doing? You didn't have any other clothes? <laughs> so I'm all about that. I get that, that you come as you are. But there is a limit to that. You might have been. But there's a time when you must be clothed right. Amen. Mm -hmm. And that time will be when it's over. Mm -hmm. Amen. A Christian is clothed in righteousness. Amen. Mm -hmm. And that righteousness comes from Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And it is imputed unto you. Amen. You didn't stumble upon it. You didn't find it. You didn't conjure it up. You were clothed in it. Mm -hmm. The Jewish culture... Another thing about that at a marriage, I thought it was very interesting that guess what they do? The bride is circled around the groom seven times. Hmm. And also, it is said sometimes once, but the bride is always taken around the groom. I just think about the Lord's church. Amen. And Ephesians, without spot or wrinkle. Mm hmm it's a wonderful thing to see. But you will not see anything without the blood of Christ being placed upon you. Coming through the blood. Your sins being covered and cleansed. Amen. All the way through. Sins past. Sins present. Sins future. People miss this. The cross of Calvary. That's where your sin was judged. Amen. If you're saved. Amen. We're not going to stand there and account for our sin. Right. That was the victory. Faith is the victory. Amen. Is your faith in that? Was he there? Did he bleed? Did he die? Amen. Amen. Was you there? That's the question. I was there. Amen. You say you're only 50 years old. I was there. Amen. He died for me. Amen. Amen. He didn't go there just hoping, well, I hope somebody will. He had a purpose. Everything God does has a purpose. You're right. Amen. Amen. We're the one that wanders out and just might stumble onto something that have a purpose. Amen. God has purpose. Amen. It was amazing. I was speaking to brother tonight about this, about the, the preparations for wedding. Everything that in their culture had a reason to it. You say, why are you telling us all this? Well, I, before I leave it, I, 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 let me share this with you. Talking about garments. You want to you check up and sort of follow me up on that? You can look in Genesis chapter 45, verse 22. You can look in Judges 14, 12. Mm -hmm. You can look in 2 Kings 5, 22. You can look in Esther 6, 8, and 8, 15. And it's interesting, in Esther, the garments of royalty. Mm -hmm. You understand there's nothing more beautiful and special you could be clothed in than the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, these are important times. And you say, well, why are you bringing this Jewish culture out? Well, we're fixing to go now to John chapter 9. And why is that? Well, you take the timeline of Luke 13 and you take John chapter 9. It's the same timeline mm -hmm. and it's in the same area. And we're going to see some works of God. John chapter 9, verse 1. And Jesus passed by, and he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned, nor his parents but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Mm -hmm. You know what he's telling them there? It's, it's a national sin. It's a, it's a sin that's in the world. It's 
It's, it's neat. It wasn't a grievous sin that he had committed or a grievous sin his parents had committed. It's sin. That's it. People ask me sometimes, well, how could, why would, if God is love, this is what you normally get from people that want to oppose you. If, well, if God is love, how come babies are born with no hearing or not seeing or, you know, because we always think when something went wrong, somebody's to blame for it. Right. And that's right in a sense. Guess who it was? You! Amen. Sin! Amen. Sin is in the world. That's it. And that's what he's saying. But watch what he does. Watch what he does. And his, in verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. You know that word sent, where it says sent me, is pimpo in the Greek. And what it means is uh, an order being taken place. It, it, it means uh, set in motion. Mm -hmm. And it also says for a temporary time span. What's he saying? I'm not always going to be here. Mm -hmm. I'm not always. Because I'm on God's plan. Mm -hmm. I'm here now. But he will ascend. Mm -hmm. Well, look at verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Amen. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sin. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seen. Amen. What are these works that he's doing? Well, we know, and I just said, he's setting things in motion. But do you understand? It's a picture of the blindness of Israel. It's due to their rejection of the Messiah that's standing before them. It's due to their always turning to false gods. It's due to them always fleeing from God. And they are blind. These are Jews he's speaking to. Right. They're understanding. They're, they're, they're starting to get some things. Especially the man that was, uh, he, he's, he can see. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that as I was studying today and thinking about these things. There's some in here right now that's this close to being able to see. Mm -hmm. To be able to come out of darkness and be able to see. To be healed of the Affliction they have. Speaking to Jews, timeline. Is it important? It's important. He keeps saying sent, sent, sent. Where was he sent? He came from there and he came here. Amen. He is showing authority. Mm -hmm. He is showing power. He is showing that he is God. He's had. You understand Matthew, the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew is proving that he is king. The book of Mark is proving he's a servant. Mm -hmm. The book of Luke proving he's the God man. We started in Luke, he's the God man. The book of John proving he's God. That's it. These things are starting to wrap together now, they're coming along. But the, another interesting thing about this is the blindness that's taking place. He's working a work. And that work means to be engaged with. It means to commit. It means to do. It means to labor. It means to minister. Mm -hmm. I thought about that, and this is totally free from my notes here, but I thought about it. Are we doing enough, Brother Larry? We have what it takes to heal the blind. You say, uh oh, Brother Pierce could say he's getting off into something. No, no. I'm not saying I can touch and be healed, be healed, be healed. I'm talking about in the spiritual realm, we have the truth. Amen. The church, the New Testament church, the Lord's New Testament church, let me preface it with that, is the only one that has authority to preach the gospel. Amen. That authority was left to it. Matthew 28, you read there, all power is given unto me. And he passed it to the church. Amen. How many were there? Verse 16 tells you in Matthew 28, there's 11. Mm -hmm. It wasn't all the saved. It wasn't all of them. 
There was 11 there. Mm -hmm. And that commission, that, that mandate was put upon the church and they have the responsibility. We have the responsibility. There's different churches represented here tonight. Each church has that responsibility to go out Amen. and try to help blind people see. Amen. To try to heal their affliction. And how do we do it? There's some now, there's some televangelists, they said they can heal and you know people flop over and do all that. And I still, it's still a marveling thing to me, and I know it's not the first time you've heard this, but it seems like they'd be hanging around hospitals if they could do that and not in arenas uh, taking in the money. Amen. Right. Amen. I mean, it, that just seems clear to me. I mean, it, who, it, if you got any love in it, anyone can love a baby born with a defect. Can they not? Well, I wonder why they're not there to touch them. Amen. Right. Heal them. Amen. Amen. I wonder why they die. Have you ever noticed that? Mm -hmm. Some of them have to cancel because they're sick. Well, that's strange with the power you got. You want to be able to touch your belly. Right. Mm -hmm. But we have the truth. We have what it takes to heal this community. This area. Tonight, there's people in here that need to be touched with this truth. Amen. Amen. They need to hear. Their ears need to be open to the gospel. Well, I want to share some culture with you, Jewish culture, about this situation here. The Jewish culture, remember, well, let's read it. Let's get it back in your mind. Verse 6. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind, of the blind man with clay. The Jewish culture, what they understand and what they still uh, believe, some still believe, the more strict sect of them still believe, is that the spittle of the firstborn has healing powers. Now, I'm just telling you, we can preach that, and we don't have to include that. Because God's power is upon His Word. Amen. But I'm trying to show you tonight that when Jesus was before these Jews, He knew exactly what He was doing. He gave illustrations. If I was to be in that time and I gave an illustration of how the GPS took me to the wrong place, they would just... Right. Right. When He gave illustrations, they knew. And when He went down and did that spittle and mixed the clay. Think about it. What's man made with? Clay. Yeah. And then the spittle in the clay. And he anoints the eyes. Mm -hmm. And then he goes to the pool of Siloam. What he was showing them, if they would have been able to see, if they would have been striving, if they'd have been thinking about everything they know of Old Testament law and everything they know and all the, and all the pictures and the, what they, they're expecting the Messiah, if they would have strove and thought about truth, they too could have seen him. Amen. But he put it upon his eyes and he goes down to the pool of Siloam. It's interesting. Where'd he go? He went to water. <laughs> well, watch as we, let's read verse 7 again and get a good hold of it. And he said unto him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sin. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seen. Are you washed in the blood? Mm, amen. Would you come seen tonight? Are you washed in the blood? Amen. This is very important because I know to the Jews it was very important. Uh, I looked up an article about it uh, by Vera Basra. Uh, it was written on May 28, 2017. It's about the healing power of saliva. They took 24 rabbits, bunnies, little, rab little rabbits, little bunnies, cocktails, whatever it might be, but they were rabbits. And on their back, on the backbone, they had a skin mark on them. They took the ointment that we would use, the spores, whatever it was, and they did 12 of them with that. They took 12 healthy humans and used their saliva and put on the other 12. Would you like to guess which ones healed faster and the hair started growing back faster and everything started looking normal faster? The spittle. The one with the spittle. The others were healing but they were way behind. Hmm. 
The Jews also use that as a test to test if there's two claiming to be firstborn. Hmm. They test it with that. So I'm not up here inflating you with something I just thought would sound good. I'm telling you that is the culture of those folks. They understood. That man understood. Mm -hmm. Because watch as we continue on. Verse 8 says, The neighbors therefore, and they which before had seen him that was blind, said, Is this not he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How are thine eyes open? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus. Isn't that, that, ought to, that ought to stir your soul. Amen. A man called Jesus. There's your answer. I was blind, but a man called Jesus. Mm -hmm. I thought I could see, but I was really blind. Amen. A man called Jesus. Oh, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to him, uh, they brought to the Pharisees him that was aforetime blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Uh oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they forget, it. well, they don't know he's the Lord of the Sabbath as well. Amen. Verse 14, and it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him, how, how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and, and I washed, and, and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath. Do you see immediately what they thought? Right. Yeah. Now, isn't it interesting? They didn't say, This man is not a miracle worker. This man is not Benny Hinn. <laughs> what they say? This man is not God. They knew. Mm -hmm. They knew by what had taken place. They can't explain it, but something's going on here. You're right. And that might be where you are tonight. I can't explain it, but something's going on within me. Amen. It could be that he's putting a little on me. Mm -hmm. Think about that for illustration. Amen. I think about you, you people just met me this week. How would you like it if I said, you know, I see that, and you got your little cut there, I'll take care of that. <laughs> huh? Would that be nice? How are you going to take care of Oh, let me get that. <laughs> I, I didn't like it when my grandma used to do that. You got something there. <laughs> but if you knew it was the savior of the world, I think you might be like Peter. Mm -hmm. Do it all. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do it all. Jesus yeah. Christ is the only one that can save you from your sin. Amen. Amen. Well, <clears throat> this pool of Siloam is interesting too. The pool of Siloam, uh, the origins of this pool reach back to King Hezekiah. The Gihon Spring in the Kidron Valley, it runs from north to south. It's 1,750 feet long, and it's, the tunnel is under the city. The pool is used for mikvah, the ceremonial things that the Jews do, the cleansing, special times, the ceremonial cleansing for converting to Judaism. Hmm. Now, isn't it interesting? He does the spittle on the eye of the man. He goes down. He comes out. He can see. Amen. What's he saying? It's a cleansing. Mm -hmm. It's a cleansing. Not the Judaism. Jesus. This man. Jesus. Amen. It's a cleansing. Amen. Notice it says sent. The water was sent. That made me think of John 4. Where was it he was headed? He went to a well. But he came with nothing to get water in. Yeah. And remember the woman at the well. He's the living water. Mm -hmm. Amen. I think there was many illustrations that I can't even get to tonight in that passage. Mm -hmm. 
I hope you're listening. He was sent. Mm -hmm. He was sent. He was sent. Well, we know in Luke 13, he's the God man. Mm -hmm. We know in John, he's proving he's God. So now we come to the closing of this. And don't get excited and start shutting your Bibles. <laughs> because I want to go back over because I'm bad about this. There's a time to contend, a time to see, and now we come to the final point, but a time to trust. Mm -hmm. There's a time to trust. Just let me get you back thinking about what we talked about last night, that Philippian jailer, when the, when the foundations were shaken and the doors bust open, what was his first thing he did? Grabbed his sword and was going to mm -hmm. go ahead and kill himself. Right. Remember I told you, because he already know, and we know from Acts 12, that was the penalty. When you lost a prisoner, it was death. And remember, I told you, what, is, it, is it coincidence that the first thing he thought of is kill myself? Why? Because he had failed. Mm -hmm. He had failed to hold up the bar. He had failed to reach the limit that he was supposed to hold. And when he failed, he knew it was death. And the wages of sin is death. Amen. amen. And if you have sinned one sin, death. Yep, amen. You don't have to continually be a habitual sinner. That's right. One sin, mm -hmm. you're condemned. Amen. And I want to tell you this, because we're going to get there again. You're going to say, we was already there. We're going there again. John chapter 3 says you're condemned already. Right, amen. He didn't condemn you. Your sin right. mm -hmm. condemns you. You can blame it on Adam. You can do whatever you want to do, but you're going to answer for it. That's yeah. it. That's right. You will stand before him with your sin all around you because you rejected Jesus Christ. You would not let him anoint your eyes and be able to see. You would not listen to the truth and say, that's true. I believe. As the man said, what must I do to be saved? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, well, we got to go through some doctrines. <laughs> Yep. Believe yep. on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because one Amen. thing Paul had over uh, me and a lot of other folks, Paul knew if a man truly believes, it's all there anyways. Mm -hmm. And then the man's got time to learn about how he was chosen from the foundation of the world, about how I came 935 miles to get here to you, and that was by God. And he took me by a woman named Lydia, and she was saved along the way, which kept, it, that kept me encouraged to keep pushing forward. That I had a plan to go somewhere else, and he said, no, you're going over here. You mad? That's what that prison guard, the jailer, could learn. Amen. But the, the point of impact was, what must I do to be saved? Amen. <laughs> Not how many as tonight. How many? You're worried about things you're not, you're not in our word about. Right. You're worried about things that this preacher can't tell you. Amen. I don't know how many, but I know in the last one, the doors are shut. There you go. Sort of like Noah and the ark. Mm -hmm. Day after day, a preacher, you know, he was a preacher of righteousness. Amen. Amen. So he was preaching something. Righteous. And they waited and waited. Mm -hmm. I have, in my mind, I picture it like this. We, th we think they must have all been evil and just wicked walking around. Well, in a sense, yes. But I, I have to believe some of them might be like our neighbors. Mm -hmm. Not bad people. Just want nothing to do with that. All right. Do you know in Revelation 21 8, there's some people there that were probably just ordinarily just decent people? Mm -hmm. Because there's eight classes of people there, and it says one of them, the one class of them is unbelief. That's right. You don't have to be a murderer. You just got to reject the truth. And that's called unbelief. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, knowing that, John chapter 3, we're right here in John. Let's go John 3. Mm. And I'm, I, I hope this, I hope if, what, I, what I hope, what I'd love to see is those that I know that stir. You say, how do you know? Preachers just know. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yep. I'm not going to get into that. You say, oh, maybe Brother Larry told you. He didn't tell me. To this day, he has not named out this and that. No, no. I'm up here. I can see. Mm -hmm. 
I can see, I know characteristics of people, I know habits of people when they're trying to avoid things. I know mm -hmm. that the truth is no. it's knocking. Like last night, that key's out there. It's corroded, that the lock's corroded from the world. But Jesus, he'll open that heart. He'll open that heart. So here in John chapter 3, as we close this out, verse 16, like I said, that famous verse. The heathen know this verse and reject God. Mm -hmm. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. There it is. Mm -hmm. But that the world through him might be saved. Amen. Amen. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Right. You're already there. You're worthy of hell. That's it. Amen. Peter, don't say that. I don't like hearing about that. You're worthy of hell. Your sins placed you there. That's right. Your wills placed you there. Your ways placed you there. Mm -hmm. Burger King says this a lot. Have it your way. <laughs> well, isn't it, isn't it amazing and ironic there that they're, they're home of what? The flame bowl? <laughs> no, have it your way. Have it your way. Mm. Have it your way, you'll go to hell. That's right. That's it. Amen. You gotta have it God's way. Amen. Amen. And you gotta come through the avenue he has sent, Jesus Christ. That's right. It's one way. I don't care what the Buddhists say. I don't care what the, the, the Hindus say. I, listen, Florida's filling up with all kinds of things down there. There's one that looks like a, a, a castle, a queen's castle down there. I thought I knew what it was, and I can't even think of it now. My wife said, no. She looked it up. No, it's this. No. Where's it all coming from? Satan. Right. That's right. Amen. Just like this man asked, and he had to strive. There's plenty of things we need to strive against. we got to get to the truth. Mm -hmm. Well, we know the truth comes to you. Well, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Right. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. There's what you don't want. Hmm. To admit what you really are. Nothing. Hmm. Right. In great need of help. Amen. I Listen, I'm a man. I know all about it. My wife said, don't you think about it? No, I got this. Hmm. Have you ever noticed when you buy something, they send a lot of paperwork in there? <laughs> I thought that was to keep it from rattling and shipping, but you know, there's directions. <laughs> <laughs> She comes home with Ikea stuff. I start running. <laughs> 10 million screws to put together. Why do I avoid it? I don't want to do this. It comes down, I don't want to. But you keep thinking you don't want to, and tonight might be the final step you take. Mm -hmm. right. Amen. Because here's where I'm going to repeat to you. In verse 19, the word condemnation is Christus in the Greek, K-R-I-S-I-S. -I -S. It's where we get our English word crisis. That's right. So tonight, without Jesus Christ, you're in a crisis. Mm -hmm. Amen. Because previous to that, we read, I'm not. I'm not in a crisis. Amen. No. When I stand before, when I stand... At the beam of seat, I have the blood of Christ on me. Amen. Now I'm going to answer for some wasted years. That old hymn, wasted years, wasted years, oh how foolish. Mm -hmm. But I'm not answering for my sin. Amen. Saved at 15, what'd you do for me? Hmm, didn't do much until here. All right. 
But you stand before him. See, when I stand there, I have an advocate. The blood of Christ. Mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Amen. I have a mediator. Amen. I have an intercessor. Amen. I don't want to embarrass them. Anybody have been in court? Why do you think there's representatives there? Because you can't represent yourself. And those who have tried have failed. Right. Condemnation. Are you condemned? Let's put it in those terms. Are you condemned tonight? You say, well, preacher, most of us, I don't think, I think most of us are saved, okay. Are you doing all you can for Christ? Mm. Well, you know, that other church does that stuff. We don't do that. Just, I, I don't know what to tell you, but, you know, we're supposed to witness. Amen. That's right. That's right. Amen. We're supposed to invite people to come. Mm-hmm. Come unto me. Amen. I will give you rest. Right. I thought the Bible did it not. Did it say preach to every preacher? I think so. Oh. <laughs> so I don't have to look for something special on Preach the gospel. Amen. There's a lost and dying world around us. And we know God, in John 6, we know God draws them unto him. And I told you that word draw means drag. Mm-hmm. And I've told people he drove me kicking and screaming. Mm-hmm. But he drove me unto him and saved my soul. Amen. Now he's made me a preacher of the gospel. Amen. What will you do? What could you do? You don't know. Because back when I was 15, I trusted Christ, and then I, I tried to do what I wanted to do for a while. I would have never imagined I'd be standing in Dover, Tennessee, preaching the gospel. Mm-hmm. Last year, I didn't know. Larry knew. I didn't. I'm just messing with him. He put it off. But I'm here. Mm-hmm. And you're here. Last year, you didn't know you'd be here on Thursday night listening to someone from Florida. But you're here. Mm-hmm. Who designs this? God. Amen. Amen. So I pray you would consider these things. And I'll repeat it again. Repetition is good. Hebrews 9, 27. It's appointed unto men and wants to die, mm-hmm. but after this, the judgment. Mm-hmm. You look the word judgment up. It's the same word, same definition as condemnation. Christus. Mm-hmm. After this, Christ. Yep. Are you going to crisis? Right. You need not be. There's breath in your lungs. The light, the light has come, and it's in your lap. You bet. I thought about when I was preaching that. I don't know what these light switches do. What's, yeah. See that black end? We call it. We call it a blackout. Mm-hmm. Black end. Right. That's how you are without Christ. Mm-hmm. Amen. But when the light comes, it's a light in mm-hmm. within. I pray you consider those things tonight. Amen. Amen.